Coming to you from Byram, Mississippi, is a church where every member matters. It's Lakeshore Church, and we are so glad for you to join us this morning. The message comes from Senior Pastor Jay Frazier as he shares from God's Word. Our goal is that everyone find a place to serve God in and outside the church. We worship and celebrate our relationship with God and strive to bring others to the cross of salvation. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier. Good morning. I thank you for joining us today. I trust that God uses this time for His glory in your life. In this ever-changing world of uncertainty, I found that we need a certain God. The scripture says He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it also says that His word never returns unto Him void. So we're excited about today. You're, we're glad you're with us. And we trust God that you'll sense and know Him during our service today. I want to share this with you. Just, just a verse, three verses that are tucked away that, that say so much to us. Verses 23 through 25. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. See, things don't just happen, guys. They're ordered by God. He wants, our, he, he wants us for our attention to be on Him. And He delights in His way. Though He fall, He shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds Him with His hand. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, for what you're going to do today. We give you praise in the house of God. May today be your day. I know, Lord, with all the festive things, but we need to be mindful, Lord, of what really being thankful is about. It's a lifestyle as well as a lip service. God, I pray that your words will be ours, or your thoughts will be ours. Most of all, we'll find ourselves obeying your word. God, we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Maybe seated, excuse me. <clears throat> Does Thanksgiving make us different? And what I mean by that is giving thanks. It's a pretty strong word to say this, but I think in our society, it's hilarious to think about people today observing Thanksgiving. It's like we're on a, we're really in our country, it seems like we're on a, a, a crash course. We're, we're on a dead-end street running about 100 miles an hour trying to get away from God. And yet by the millions of people, let's say tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, people will observe Thanksgiving today and do not observe a relationship with the one that we should be thankful. Our nation, it seems like, is trying to divorce ourselves from God. And yet we see in our history in Thanksgiving week and observing this is the very one of the very great examples of where our nation came from and what we stand for. There's a lot going on in our world today. Values and morals, or the lack of, I should say. In our world, it seems like we're permeated with an anything goes mentality. It seems like we can make a cause out of anything, and it doesn't matter what it looks like. Anybody has the right to do whatever they want to do, regardless of what it is. I really believe this everything about me. It's something on our mind for our church and community, but I say this as a nation I think 2016 will be a pivotal year for our nation. Not just because we have a general election and we're electing a new president, but there's a lot of other things that are on the table, if you will, for this year. And there's a lot of things. And yet lately I've been studying about John the Baptist. Use that in my men's class lately. And, and I just put this in. I think we should be like John the Baptist. We must be, in this day and age, we must be a voice that's crying in the wilderness. No matter how dark it is, no matter how thick the trees are, no matter how much uncertainty there is, God expects you and me to be a voice. <laughs> what I do know about what's going on in the world today is that we need God. Would you agree with that? We need God personally. We need God professionally. We even need God politically in our country. We need to know God and we need to understand a new awareness of who God is. In the center of that at this particular time of year, we need to be thankful that we have God. Yes, the person of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we're also thankful for our Heavenly Father today. And as much as we have, basically what I want to do today is deal with our Heavenly Father and the effect or the direction He has in our life. To begin to talk about His attributes and characteristics, we could talk about love and we could talk about different things, but I just want to do it from the, I want to share from the standpoint of how He affects our life and thus the sermon title is that I'm thankful that each one of us have a path 
and a purpose in our life. Whether we observe it or not, God created us that way. I think about those things. I think about some scriptures that come to mind. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There it is. Psalm 57, verse 2 says, I will cry unto God the Most High who performs all things for me. When you see that there's a, there's a part that God plays in our life that only God can play. We read at the beginning of our church service today in our opening scripture, but, and one other, we want to talk about the, the prophet Jeremiah. There's some verses that we hold on to for some of the things that we stand for in our world today, but Jeremiah in two different places will highlight. Jeremiah 1, verse 5, God told Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the, in, in the womb, in, the, in your mother's belly, I knew you. That lets us know that God has a path for our life. He has a purpose. He knows us. He, he knows where He wants us to go and what we need to accomplish in our life. We're not just a bunch of amoebas that are bouncing through this world and, and wherever we go, wherever we end up is just random order. It's amazing how, many terminolo how much terminology that I can share with you today that's a lot of the rhetoric that we're hearing in even higher education today. It's things like random order. God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. And understanding before he formed Jeremiah, he knew him. Let me give you one more, and we read it this morning already. In Jeremiah 29, God says, I know the plans I have for you, the plans to prosper you and not to harm you. So that when you seek God, and I love that last part, it says if you want to know God, if you, want, if you need something from God, you need to seek God with your whole heart. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13. Now say in summation of Jeremiah, God had a path and a purpose for his life. And he has one for each one of us as well. And if you want to know the nature of God, if you want to understand more about God, then understand what God has programmed you to be, what God has destined you to be through his son. Thankful for a path and a purpose. I'll do something a little different. I've seen this on different levels, but we're going to attempt to do something really different. I want to look at five ships today, and the guys are going to go ahead and put them up there so that it doesn't concern you. What in the world is he talking about? We're going to end today talking about the Mayflower. But today I want to show you five ships of the sovereign, and there they are. you got companionship, leadership, relationship, citizenship, and worship. And I want to show you today that when we talk about a path and a purpose, in these five is where we are. This is from the beginning of, of mankind to the present day that we live in. And throughout all eternity, these, this is the path. And let me, just, let me just get into it real quick. Like, first, we have companionship. When God created Adam in the garden, as much as I see it in the Word of God, it wasn't, for those, it wasn't for the last three, it was for the first two. When He created Adam in the garden, it was for companionship. I think God created, God looked at, let us, let us create man in our image. And when God created Adam, He created a, a, a subspecies, if you will. He created an image, someone, a being, a human being, and His likeness and His image. Now, some of the likenesses and some of the image of God, as I think about this, he gave us vocabulary. I've often said in the world that we live in, people say, well, I know how, she, you know, I know how Suzanne's, I know what's going on, just the way she's acting. I have no clue what's going on. 26 years later, there are times she doesn't understand me and I don't understand her unless we tell each other what's going on. And we're the only part of God's creation that he gave vocabulary to. You've heard me before, they say dolphins do and they say gorillas do, but I haven't heard much vocabulary on the Discovery Channel. But today I can tell you exactly what's going on in my life because I can verbalize it to you. That's part of us being in, in God's image and His likeness. God didn't leave anything to chance. If you want to know about God, He's got a book called The Holy Scriptures, the Bible that tells you exactly all about God. Different formats, it does, not, it does not confuse one book to the next. It all goes together as a complete story. But it's companionship. God created Adam for that reason. It says in the scripture that he would come in the cool of the day. Someone said, well, you're leaving Eve out. No, Eve was created for Adam. Eve was created because God looked at his creation and all of his creation was good except Adam was by himself. He was one of a kind. So he created Eve for Adam. All right? Now, I'm not going to say she didn't have a relationship with God because she did and those types of things. But it says God would come in the cool of the day. What's noticeably absent again in the Word of God is we don't know how long that went on. We don't know if that was a week before they sinned, a month before they sinned, or if it was a hundred years before they sinned. But we do know that they were in the garden and God would come on a regular basis and just have companionship with them. 
talk about the day. We know they talked about the day because after they sinned, they talked about the day. I don't think it's just something that started. I think it went on because they were companions of God. That's, listen to me very carefully, that's all God's ever wanted from you and me. Hmm? I can't tell you how many times in my spiritual life this has been the conviction of my heart. Jay, you're so busy that you can't spend time with me. You're so busy being a minister <laughs> that you're not in love with me the way you used to be. Hmm. God hasn't asked me to go recite books of the Bible and some, some religious stuff that we would do. God hasn't asked me to go walk across a bed of coals to show my love to Him. All God's ever wanted from me, listen to me, is me. You know what I notice? That's, that's marriage, isn't it? Isn't that what parenting's about? Can't tell you how many times I've had parents come to me and I said, here, try this. Let them have their day. Just take them out somewhere. Date your daughter. Go, go do something with them. Let them go have their day. It'll change things. Because you know what? God made us that way. Because we're made in His image and His likeness. Every now and then, Suzanne said it yesterday that I want to know if I want to go out on a date. And I told her Georgia was playing on TV. But anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that later on. Why do they always have to pick football time to go out on a date? But seriously, I can't tell you how many times in our marriage when Suzanne said it's about time for us to have a date night. Because we got a lot going on, but we haven't been spending time together. It's companionship. Well, it doesn't stop there. Listen to me. There's also leadership we see in the garden too. It says in verse number 26 of, of Genesis 1 that God gave mankind, Adam, dominion over the garden. Listen, if, if you're for the ethical treatment of animals, you might, not let, you might not like this next thought. But hunting season's in. You know, I've been in the woods hundreds of times and I've never seen a deer with a gun. If, if, deer, if, if deer start carrying guns, I'm not going anymore. And I do believe that I'm, I'm responsible. I think if, if God blessed me to the point that I was to kill something like that, I have responsibility to take care of it. I don't think I should be, just be out there desecrating God's creation. God did create for us things. And, and then I can show you in the New Testament where what God says is clean is clean. And, and so we don't want to spend a lot of time there. But I will tell you this, in the Garden of Eden, Adam was given dominion over the creation. Now let me be political with you for a minute. You ready? I believe we ought to take care of the environment. But Genesis shows us how to do it. You can't divorce God and then think the environment is going to be the number one issue. The number one issue in our world, listen to me very carefully, is not the environment. It's the one who created the environment. Hello? And the further we get away from God, the more chaotic it's going to be with us trying to take care of His creation. See, let me tell you about Suzanne. I love her. Let me tell you what she started. She couldn't do this to a year ago. Because I pastored you folks for 30 years, or been in the ministry for 30 years, my blood pressure started going crazy. And it's nothing more than pastoring. I know it is. It's just pastoring. If you knew you the way I know you, you know why my blood pressure is doing what it's doing. Huh? And just look over at somebody else and say, it's your fault our pastor's on high blood pressure medicine. It is. But let me tell you what Suzanne started. I'm one of those that talk to the TV. I am. Yeah, I'm just, you know... And if one of my adversaries come on the TV, and I won't name names, but there's a bunch of them. Most of the time they're on the other aisle politically, or, or they're saying something crazy about the environment, or, or whatever. Or they're taking God for granted. I start talking to the TV. I mean, like they're right there in the room. Let me tell you what Suzanne does. You know, this is it now. She couldn't do this more. You go. She walks in and says, have you taken your pill this morning? <laughs> She's talking about the high blood pressure medicine. And you know, the day and age that we live in. In the, there's a lot of leadership issues in our world today. Would you agree with that? But let me tell you something. Leadership in any arena will never be what it needs to be if you divorce God out of it. And that's including the environment. That's including politics. That's including America. That's including the church. That's including family. That's including a life. See, God gave us dominion. But listen to me very carefully, church. Man, Thanksgiving meal's coming, so I got you captivated today. Listen to me. We're going to stand in front of a holy, righteous God and we're going to give an account for the leadership opportunities God gave us. It's going to happen. There's number two ship. Number three is relationship. See, Adam and Eve sinned, broke relationship with God. They saw they were naked for the very first time. You, you, you've heard me say this before if you've been around. You want me to tell you what's unique? 
I don't know about the whole form of the way church would happen. I don't know. There wouldn't be redemption because we hadn't sinned. But you know something? Listen to me. You ready? If we hadn't sinned, we'd all be naked this morning here in church. <laughs> but, but, but before you look around the room and get nauseated, let me tell you something. Listen. Listen. In the church, if we were all sitting here naked and had never sinned, we wouldn't know we were naked. That's what I understand about the Scripture. So before you go way off there that my preachers lost it, just know that we wouldn't know we were naked. That's the great news. Hmm? But understand this. Because of sin, companionship will no longer get it. Hmm. Doesn't matter how much you warm up to him. It's not about companionship anymore. You can't even hide behind that you're created in the image and likeness of God in leadership. Because of sin, we must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We stand in front of God, companionship's not going to get it. We stand in front of God, leadership's not going to get it. We stand in front of God, the only thing that's going to wash is the blood of Jesus Christ that comes because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ in our life. So that's what happens. So we got a relationship. And then because of relationship, just as a seven-year-old boy on a Sunday night walked the aisle just like this, knelt at an altar and asked Jesus to come into my life, I began a relationship with Jesus. And I found out later on, not only did I have a relationship with him, but I'm a, I, there's citizenship too. I went from being, a, as Paul said in Ephesians 2, I went from being a, a foreigner and a stranger to being a fellow citizen with the saints. Look at it, it says, with the saints and of the household of God. You know what that means? Listen to me. You're all sitting down, right? You're enjoying that seat. You really are. You know, my legs are sort of hurting, but it's okay. Let me tell you something. I stand up here, everybody think, he's it. The lights are on him. Everybody knows his name. He's something. You know what that verse says? There's no difference between me standing up and both sitting down. We're both part of the household of God. We both have a part to play, Blake. Yours might be singing and playing and beating that thing to death like you do. Mine's screaming and hollering and spitting on people. But when we start talking about our differences, God uses our differences to bring a totality and a unity in the body of Christ. And so many times what we do in the, what we do in the Scripture, what we do in our, in our walk with God is, we look at it and say, well, I'm a nobody. I can't sing. I can't take toe to tune in a bucket. I can never get up there and scream and holler like he does. So I must be second rate. No, 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 no. We're all part of the household of God. We're all different, but in Christ we're together. We're citizens. Don't ever, un, don't, ever, un, don't ever undersell yourself. Because God went to great lengths that companionship, leadership, relationship, for us to have a citizenship in God. But let me give you one more. Why do we do what we do? Now, I don't want to cause anybody, ha, oh, ha, but you know what I find that's amazingly absent in Genesis with the story of Adam and Eve before sin? They didn't worship God. They were companions. Blake, what did they have to worship over? All they knew is he created me and it's good stuff. You and I have a lot to worship God over. We were dead in trespasses and sin. We were assured for hell as if we were already there. We deserve no better than hell because of the sin in our life. We had told God repeated, we told him no repeatedly in our life. We might have been converted and walked away from God. We might have chose of life, uh, uh, of sensual sin and, and doing our own thing and told God just to get, just get, get, get used to it. <laughs> Whatever. But God kept on loving us. Sometimes in spite of us. Aren't we blessed? And you know what? What else is there? What else is there for a holy hand to raise up and say thank you? What else is there when we realize that God's hand reached into the, as one person said it, old southern gospel song says he reached into the guttermost and saved us to the uttermost. What else is there? What else is there? Not just an hour or a day. What else is there to tell God thanks? For your consideration today, go and look in Philippians 4 and you'll find out the peace of God is tied to how thankful we are. There's people that want the peace of God in their life to take care of their heart and mind in Christ Jesus our Lord, but go read the previous verse. The previous verse talks about bringing yourself before the Lord and part of that 
attitude is a thankfulness. Hmm? Paul went so far to tell us to give thanks in all things, for it's the will of God concerning you. When God doesn't make sense, still know that He's God. <laughs> and when you don't see the end, just know that God's not threatened by what you're going through. He's still God. He's still in control. And our thankfulness produces an environment where God can work. I believe with everything about me. And part of that working is peace. So I want to end. I'm going to do this. I'm not even going to look at my notes today. That's how jacked up I am about this Thanksgiving sign. I want to end here. When I was a teenager, I, you know, for the school teachers here, this is not going to help. I, I know you think there's teenagers here, and Brother Jay, you have the opportunity to mold them, and some of the stuff you say doesn't do too well. Well, this is one of those that doesn't do too well. How do I say this in a nice way? I despised history class when I was coming along. I'm an, a, I'm an a application kind of guy. Just recently, Mallory and I and Abby Kate came to the rescue. We did some word problems in algebra. I like word problems. I can figure them out. Really like it when my daughter's there and I said, you don't have this right. Daddy knows all. And then you find out when she comes home from school the next day, daddy didn't know all. But I love the applied stuff. I, I like trying to figure something out. Give me a stuff. I used to like, you know, putting together model cars. I, I like that kind of, what can we work? We liked all that out in the youth building. I just like that kind of stuff. But finding out what somebody did in 1334 in the 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I got to tell somebody that on a test, never won me over. I'd rather be at basketball practice. Let me tell you something. The older I get, history means more to me. When I see where America's going, then I feel like as a leader in this arena, I have a God-given responsibility to know where we've been so that maybe I can stand and be that voice in the wilderness going, it's not going to end well, folks. I can say this as a prophet. You ready? America's not going to end well the further and further we get away from God. There's too many things that have happened in American history that were the hands of God. Come on. That man's not that bright. God blesses those that bless him. Do you know what the scripture says? The wicked are turned into hell and all nations that forget God. To forget him, you've heard me say it before, to forget him means you have to have known him. And I think we're on that crash course right now. But I went back and read about the pilgrims. I just felt like I wasn't paying attention in class, probably didn't pass that test. So I went and did a little research. A group of people in England decided they didn't want to be under the oppression of a state-run church. So they said, it's got to be something different. So they set out. They were big dreamers, by the way. They worked all this stuff, and over time, they ended up getting on a boat. The boat was the name of the Mayflower. Huh. Next time you see one of those big moving trucks, you'll know where they got their name from. Bunch of folks, dozens of people, got on this boat, and for 65 days... They sailed the Atlantic. Sixty-five days. Can you imagine? Hmm. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the faith? Can you imagine the doubt? Can you imagine the problems? Can you imagine the body odor? I'm just telling you. The halitosis, I don't imagine they brush their teeth much. Hmm. Sixty-five days. Because they had a common purpose and a common vision. A land of freedom. Not where I could worship whatever God I want to, but so I can be free to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go look it up. It's in there. It wasn't until the 60s did America start incorporating this, just worship whatever God you want to. Up until then, the freedoms of America were how you worshipped Jehovah God. Not all these other gods that we hear about today. Hmm? We're so progressive that we're backing up in a hurry, in my opinion. The pilgrims, 65 days in, in the Mayflower. Right before they got to land, 41 men signed a pact together called the Mayflower Compact. And basically out of that document it said this, we will be a good society with respect of each other and will have respect for Almighty God. 
don't hear that much in the books anymore, do you? So that's what they did. The point I want to make is this. I've talked about the five ships that show us the path and the progression, much like the four crosses that you see behind me. But I also want to tell you like this. What good is a ship if there's not a shore? <laughs> what good's a ship if you're not going anywhere? If you notice those five, that's a progression that leads to eternity. You know what I know about heaven, Blake? We're going to worship. You're going to have a job. We're all going to be redeemed, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Hmm? We're going to worship in eternity. So God's companionship, He fixed it through Jesus. For all eternity, we're going to worship. So I know it works. So I don't know if that's over there. It does. It says it. Book of Revelation says it. It says that they're going to strike up the cord and we're all going to stop what we're doing and we're going to worship God. Right there in that moment, the entire civilization of heaven. It's in there. You know what it says? This is going to be the song. You ready? Y'all want to sing it? I don't know what tune it is, but this is the song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That's going to be the chorus of all choruses in heaven forever, Blake. Huh. So, back to the pilgrims. They see the shore. Can you imagine what it was like? I imagine when they ran aground, whatever they did, they tied it off. I don't know what, how they did it. But I bet you some of those guys struck out before they ever got to the bank. 65 days. Could you imagine as a church family standing together for 65 days? Listen, we'd split a church four ways if we stayed in the ship 65 days together. We'd have four departments in the church. You can't come over here. You can't come over there. 65 days they've been in a boat together. I bet you guys started jumping out into the water, swimming toward the shore, and they got down to the shore. This is what they did. You went, mm, 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 mm. And you know, before you think, oh, he's just carrying. No, let me tell you something. There was a spiritual thing going on. God has answered our prayers. <laughs> God has seen us through. A new day has dawned. <clears throat> How do I raise, rein this in? Simply by telling you. There's a shore that's coming, folks. The greatest thing to be thankful for today. I could talk about my health. I could talk about 26 years of marriage. I could talk about I'm just about surviving three teenagers in my house all year long. But the number one thing to be thankful for is if I drop dead right now, there's a shore. There's a shore. <laughs> Brother Jay, can you know? Had a conversation with a young lady about that this week. You can know. John... His epistle wrote it this way, that a person has a witness within themselves. So the number one thing today to be thankful for is there's a shore coming. Our desire through this extension of our church is for you to experience Christ personally right where you are. We trust you know Him. Uh, you know Christ is your Savior and you're serving Him today. If not, today's a great day to begin that relationship. If we could help you to get to know Him, please contact us through the information that will be on the screen. If you're in the area, we would love to meet you here in person at Lakeshore. Have a blessed day, and we look forward to seeing you next time.